I think a full comprehensive approach to poverty isn't just about raising the floor like with income, but it's also about thinking about that ceiling yeah. and where all the money's going. And if we just have a floor raise approach without thinking about things like the market have response to it, especially in the housing market, you know, those approaches can be diluted. Yeah. So, I mean, poverty is a, a deep, deep problem and it ha should have deep, deep solutions to it. I want to give a special thank you to our season two sponsors. MHEB Incorporated, Amish Gazebos, Espen Shade Farms, and Espen Shade Mills. To learn more about our sponsors, visit wsm.org backslash podcast. Hi, everyone. It's Jack Crowley from Water Street, and here we're here once again for our Restorers podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. This is our final episode of season two. Matthew Desmond is our guest today. Matthew is a Pulitzer Prize winning author of the book Evicted. His most recent book is Poverty by America. Fantastic read, very challenging. Um, and he's a professor of sociology at Princeton University. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, Jack, thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah. I wanted to show your book Evicted as well, but every copy I've ever purchased, I've ended up lending out to somebody and I don't get them back. That's the excuse. Which is usually a really good sign. That's 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 what's going on, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's an excellent book. Actually, we've recommended it to uh, a lot of our leaders in the organization um, and have bought copies to hand out to new staff members to help them kind of get an understanding of some of the what our guests have experienced here at Water Street. That means a lot. Thanks, man. I mean, one of the the best things about my job is just going around the country and talking to folks that are on the front lines of this crisis, you know, and learning from mm -hmm. folks all around the country about what's working, what's not working, you know, the problems they're seeing. And, and so it's just a, you know, it's a thrill to be in conversation with you. And I appreciate you engaging that, that book like that. Yeah. And Matt, your work, not just with Evicted and with Poverty by America, but your work uh, in your teaching at Princeton, I know there's been a lot of focus on poverty, a lot of focus on homelessness. What has drawn you to that? What what sparked that passion for you to make this your life work? Uh, yeah, so I grew up in a little town in Arizona called Winslow, Arizona, and uh, money was always tight around our table. Um, grew up pretty poor um, and had, you know, experienced some of the indignities of poverty growing up, had, you know, the light shut off and the gas shut off. And then, um, you know, went to college on a bunch of student loans and scholarships. And, and then when I was in college, the bank uh, foreclosed our home. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I remember going back home and, and moving my parents and, um, and being ve very upset, you know, uh, about that. And I think, I think that started getting to me. Um, I was also that kid in college that was having his mind blown, you know, about, mm -hmm. You know, we grew up poor, but, you know, we still had this American dream story in our home, you know, and what I was hearing from my Boy Scout leaders or my church leaders was different from what I was reading, you know, in, in books and, and the studies. And so, you know, when I wasn't working, I was either in the library trying to figure out, like, what's the American story when it comes to inequality and poverty, hmm. or I was on the sidewalk, you know, and I was talking to homeless folks around my university. I went to Arizona State University and Mill Street had just a bunch of folks experienced homelessness. And just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a hen, I wasn't on the soup kitchen. I was just trying to befriend them and, and hear their stories. And I think there was an instinct I had, you know, to, to draw both to the library and to the sidewalk, you know, to really fully understand that. And uh, I don't know, graduated from college, you know, still really confused and angry about poverty and just started mm. digging in more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that really speaks to what stuck out to me when I first read Evicted, I think is it's that mix of both the really astute kind of um, statistical background, the bigger um, policy issues, but it was so personal. I mean, yeah. you spent a, an enormous amount of time just getting to know people and understand their experience. And I think you portrayed that really, really well. Um, so it sounds like that was it from the beginning. You're studying, you're in the library, you're going to classes, but you're you're mixing that personal experience in your understanding of the issues at hand. Yeah. I mean, I learned so much, you know, just following families getting evicted and, and spending time with their landlords, you know, carrying out the eviction. And it was just, it was just that I, I was learning and learning and learning every day. And then, you know, I just felt that I had a responsibility to try to write about folks in their full complexity and, yeah. and, you know, try to, 
invert the way that, you know, academics like me usually write books. Because what we usually do, right, is we say, okay, here's our idea, here's our data, and then here's like a little vignette. Yeah. You know, and I wanted the I wanted the people to drive the story. They were my biggest teachers anyways. Why shouldn't they be the, the reader's biggest teachers? And so, you know, I remember trying to think about that architecture of the book and saying, okay, when I'm going to write about Arlene, I want the reader to really have a connection with her before I tell you things like the racial disparities in the eviction rate. And there was also a responsibility I thought I had to folks that I think the readers would have mixed feelings about. So like Sharina, the main landlord I wrote about, you know, you meet Sharina at the beginning of the book when she's handing out groceries to Arlene, right? So when you see her doing these really generous things to tenants, giving tenants breaks, helping them out, but you all, then you kind of get to, you see her, you know, evicting tenants, evicting them on Christmas day. And then, and then she does some stuff that I think a lot of readers had, had real troubles with. And a lot of, you know, folks will come up and say, you know, is Sharina a good person or a bad person? (laughs) And I, I kind of, I kind of like that question because it, it's, it reflects, gosh, it's complex, you know, the complexity of it. And I think there's the, how you tell that story, you know, mattered for, for allowing readers to, to see Sharina in her full, full light too. I, you know, I think that a lot of folks who do this work, right, think we have to come with the data. But in my experience, coming with the stories yeah. really, really opens a lot of doors, too. Yeah, man, there's so much the dichotomy of those things The it would be so much easier if we could just identify the good guy and the bad guy. Right. <laughs> and then create policy to protect the good guy from the bad guy. Yeah. And it's not always that simple. Um, right. And, right. And, but like in housing. OK, so in housing, I wish. Sometimes we did a little bit more bad guy stuff, actually. <laughs> so like, you know, like when you think about the landlord is doing the most evictions hmm. in many cities, it's just a handful of guys and people that are in legal aid or people that are, you know, are, are in homeless service provision. You know, the guys, you know, their names, you know who right. they are. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you know, like in Tucson, Arizona, the top 100 buildings evict, I think, like two fifths of the city. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. It suggests that a small number of property owners are doing an outsized amount of damage mm. when it comes to homelessness. Yeah. And maybe we can think of like an intervention that's very targeted. And then on the other side, that also means that there's property owners that are keeping their rents low, right? Keeping their properties up to date, yeah. trying, to, trying to keep families housed. And we don't know who they are either. You know, right. so it's kind of like I'd like a lot more transparency on this stuff because you're right that it's complex, but it's also like there are some some actors that are causing a oh, yeah, yeah. lot of Yeah, and from my own experience, I know that in identifying, uh, yeah, I used to live on South Christian Street here in Lancaster. Hmm. Um, there were some significant slumlords on our block and the turnover was ridiculous and it wasn't hmm. caused by the family's irresponsibility or bad actions, hmm. right. right? And so we knew that, we saw that. We also saw those who never cared for their houses and right. tried to talk to the city, like how do we get the information on who these landlords are and how do we get pressure on them and get them out of our neighborhood right um, but it, you know is the policies don't always allow for that action quickly from the city side yeah and so it took a lot of grassroots work from us to kind of unearth it and put pressure on them in different ways yeah i, I love that point because often you know for folks that are getting evicted their names are very exposed oh, right yeah. eviction record you know and so there's a lot of transparency there but often the folks that are doing the eviction, it's under a shell company or an LLC. You don't really know who owns, who's a real owner. I remember doing evictions like with a sheriff, like when I wrote Evicted. So that was like 2008, 9, 10. And so you'd be on an eviction move and you'd be like, what's happening? And they'd say, OK, Jack is my landlord. This is what happened. And then I remember going on eviction moves like in 14, 15, 16. And, you know, you'd go you'd go up to a tenant and say, what's going on? And they'd be like. I mean, I got this letter from this bank. And so I sent the check to them, but then they sent it back saying, we're not the owner. And it was all this just confusion of of ownership. So I think that like, we can think about policies that bring the transparency. For example, someone told me that in Rochester, New York, they passed a law that if you want to evict someone, you have to use your real name, your real name. Now I haven't fact checked this. I think, you know, but so, but it sounded to me like a really great policy that <laughs> bring transparency into the process. Yeah, yeah. So I want to pivot a little bit in our conversation uh, away from just evictions and, and look at uh, some of your experience that you've had in looking at poverty in general and how it impacts families, individuals. We first met 
um, when you were working on a project with the New York Times uh, last fall. And I think the title of that project was A Life Without a Home. And uh, just a wonderful piece that elevated uh, the voices of people experiencing homelessness. And um, I loved how it looked at people in different circumstances, those who are couch surfing, those who are living in cars. And your piece of that was looking at um, individuals who are living in shelters and uh, have reached that point in their journey. Um, appreciated you coming here. Uh, our guests really appreciated the chance to tell their story. And, uh, and, and I love how the whole point of that project was to elevate voices. Um, I'm curious to hear just about your experience. You visited not just Water Street, but you've been at shelters all over the country. Um, maybe you could just give a little reflection on what you've seen and, and how even that experience of going into a shelter can impact uh, people who are at that level of poverty. They've been evicted, uh, whatever circumstance led to them uh, being without a home. Uh, and then they, they're looking for help and they come to a shelter. Yeah, I, I feel that writers and, and reporters could have a bit more um, perspective when it comes to writing and thinking about shelters. I mean, um, I, I think that a, a lot of shelters get a really hard rep. And, um, you know, and it's it's because, you know, you're just triaging extreme poverty, you know, mm -hmm. and often dealing with things like mental health issues, sometimes uh, dr drug addiction, sometimes not sometimes domestic violence, you know, it's just an, an incredible, uh, heavy uh, burden that a lot of shelters are, um, are carrying, you know, that said, and I also think like there's this be in my bonnet too about the reporting on shelters, which is like, you know, a lot of people don't want to go to shelters. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that there's folk, mo the biggest reason that there are folks that are unhoused isn't because on the street isn't because they don't want to go to shelters It's because there's literally not enough shelter beds. Right. right. And so, you know, we see this, especially in States like California, where there's just the number of shelter beds vastly uh, um, are not um, up to the need for people that are sleeping rough outside. And so I, I would just like to see a bit more catch in our voice, I guess, when it comes to to shelters that said, you know, some shelters do, a better job than others. And mm -hmm. um, I think that the shelters that most move me and most impress me are the shelters that, you know, are attuned to people's dignity and agency and are looking not only to meet people's material needs, but the whole person, their, their mm -hmm. emotional needs, their spiritual needs. And so I was incredibly moved when I visited Water Street. You know, uh, you guys are meeting people's dental needs and you're doing it in a way that's attuned to often you know, some people coming in with years of, of trauma, with uh, with medical neglect, uh, you're attuned to that, you're, you're, you have therapeutic services. And, you know, I, I talked to maybe, you know, 12, 13, 14 of your guests, and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and they were very open about their experiences in, but were also very grateful for the community that's been created at water street and people talked about it as a community and they, and some, some guests I've met had been there before, you know, oh, and yeah. they had flown in and out of homelessness and could, could say, Hey, when I first came to water street, there was this problem. We raised it. They fixed it. We addressed it. You know, there was a, there was this uh, rec room that you guys have, which yeah. you know, for the guests was like a guest motivated thing. Right. Yeah. And so, I think that was very meaningful, you know, to the folks that I, I spoke with and, you know, talked about, you know, feeling not just like a number or a process, but really feeling, um, feeling, uh, feeling that there's, there's voice there. You know, I think that was incredibly meaningful. Um, there was also, you know, I feel that you've, y'all you have learned to meet people where they are in their journey. Right. And so if some people just need, shelter you know you're meeting that and if some people are willing to commit to a more a long-term permanent housing track you meet them there and i'm wondering if that was like that for y'all at the beginning or was that something that you learned over the years as, you, as the work went along yeah i think it it has adapted over time i mean it's one of the things i've loved in my role is i've had a chance to kind of dig back into our history and we've been around for a long time 119 mm. years oh yeah and uh and the initial shelter work started literally in 1909 providing apartments to young ladies who had been kind of ostracized by their family because of moral choices mm. um funny that 
far fewer young men found themselves on the street because of bad moral choices. <laughs> but, um, but that was how it started. And then within 10 years of that, they opened their first men's shelter. And through, I mean, I think economically and societally, there were different reasons that led people to come to a shelter back then. Um, and they actually had, you know, a policy of like 10 cents a night for a bed. Um, mm. If you could afford, and if you couldn't afford it, you could either work in the kitchen or if you couldn't work or pay, they'd still give you a bed. Um, mm -hmm. But it changed over time. And then probably, I think in the 70s and 80s, as we saw more chronically homeless people who couldn't just with the support of a bed, you know, make their own way over time, find a job, get back out. And we saw more complex issues with, with addictions and with mental health um, and with trauma and, and those things just becoming better informed was when Water Street began adding more long-term services and, um, and pro providing those options. And I think we've gotten better over time, even in understanding what those root issues are, that it's not just treating kind of the surface level issues, but like, you know, what led to that? You know, what right. were the three or four steps that led to you becoming homeless before it was you got drunk and missed work or cursed out your boss, right? Um, what were the underlying things that led to that? So I think we, we have evolved over time. Um, but again, we, we do offer here at Water Street, we have that just the shelter level services where we're going to help people try to find a job as quickly as possible, find a new place to live if they already have a job, or if they do want to go deeper and address the root issues, we're going to walk with them through that journey as well. Yeah. In our space, it can be really easy to, to think like, oh, we figured out how to do this and other shelters and other cities just don't, you know, they do it wrong and they're dehumanizing places. And um, the reality is it, it is incredibly tough work. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate you acknowledging that. And I know here in Lancaster, we don't have enough shelter beds uh, for the number of people who are on the street. And so that's a constant challenge where as a community, we're going to be reopening uh, in December, another low barrier shelter uh, that'll be housed and run by another agency. And we're partnering with them to help train up their staff. Yeah. Um, they're going to be a low barrier shelter, HUD defined low barrier, which is even more challenging than our level of emergency shelter. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's high burnout. It's very difficult on the staff. And so it's not right, but it's not surprising sometimes when those coming off the street are met in a harsh way and they're not really met with loving open arms. And that's that's the constant challenge for us is how do we equip our staff and invest in them so that they can demonstrate love to every single one of our guests who come through the door. So, And when you do that, there's a return on your investment, right? You're drawing people's potential and beauty out. And I think, you know, if we're treating folks that have experienced incredible traumas and hardship in a way that's harsh or not even harsh, just kind of cold, you know, you go to a welfare office, yeah. you take your number, you know, you wait, you know, half a day for a 10 minute, uh, you know, conversation with a caseworker, you know, um, that's not drawing out that, that full potential. And you don't get to see that this brightness that, that you get yeah. to see when you invest in the whole person. I also think that this is, you know, a lesson to kind of idea that poverty is easily solved by a silver bullet. You know, mm -hmm. if we just had a certain thing and I, I get the attraction to those arguments because, right. you know, it, you know, in a way um, we're, we're just trying to do something big and meaningful, you know, whether it's a UBI or, or, or a, you know, or a housing for all model. And, yeah. and I certainly have been stumping for, for more housing for years and years and years. Absolutely. But, you know, I think we've seen some examples from California and other other places where, you know, you do you do invest in the housing part, but not this wraparound services part. And you, your success rate isn't as high. Right. And so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was not to interrupt, but I wanted to, you know, I think the first time I saw you in person, you were speaking at a, at a banquet for another organization here in Lancaster, uh, HTC. And when you spoke at that, it was after you wrote Evicted and um, you were advocating that for the recognition of housing as a, as a human right. One of the approaches to doing that is is the housing first philosophy um, that HUD has embraced. But it, it was kind of proposed in that silver bullet type of way. Like if we just yeah. put all of our energy towards housing first, we can resolve homelessness. And the, the data is not showing that, right? Actually, homelessness has increased since HUD adopted that. And in places like California, where not only the federal funds went that direction, but the state and local funds followed suit, it's gotten even worse. Um, but we also know housing first can be 
a really powerful tool for a segment of those experiencing homelessness. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that and, and how, you know, having places like Water Street, having, you know, somehow connecting services with housing um, might be a better approach than just the singular answer of housing first. Yeah. Cool. So I think when some people hear housing first, they what they hear is just housing. Right. And I think that what a full, robust, successful housing first model means is, OK, let's address this immediate human need of someone house shelter right now without any of the questions asked. So, you know, this would be a low barrier to housing approach first. And then we follow that up with services if folks need them. Now, some people just need a home. Right. I mean, right. we got a million public school kids now that are homeless. Right. We've got a lot of family homelessness and we have a housing shortage. And there are some folks that they just need safe, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And there's folks that need a much deeper intervention. And so I think that one of the housing first models that I'm really high on is what we did with to attack veteran homelessness, mm -hmm. you know, since 2000, which was, you know, meeting folks at risk of, of homelessness, usually through the health sector, you know, the VA hospitals and those kind of things, identifying their needs, providing them a housing first model, but also providing them often with social services and medical services, massive reduction in veteran homelessness over the last 20 years because of that yeah. model. So expanding that model to everyone without a safe, affordable place to live seems to, to me to make a lot of sense. I think that um, I think that it's both true that we need a lot more housing and a lot more affordable housing. And it's also true that for a certain segment of the homeless population, they also need other kind of social services if we're going to restore them to full humanity, you know, and, and really meet all their needs. And so I think that um, I think that for some that can be a difficult conversation because uh, mm -hmm. we we do we are looking for a, a quick hit. And you brought up the universal basic income, which is kind of another policy that's often talked about in this. Just do this. Just, if we yeah. just did this, we can we can make a difference. And I think a full comprehensive approach to poverty isn't just about raising the floor like with income. It's also about thinking about that ceiling. Yeah. and where all the money's going. And if we just have a floor raise approach without thinking about things like the market have response to it, especially in the housing market, you know, mm -hmm. those approaches can be diluted. Yeah. So, I mean, poverty is a, a deep, deep problem and it ha should have deep, deep solutions to it. Mm -hmm. We've seen here in Lancaster, um, you know, the average home sale now is $350,000. It's something like a 40% increase over even five or 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's huge. It's not a Lancaster problem. As you well know, it's, it's all across America. The, the local figure for our County, which is only 600,000 people in our County is that we need to create 12,000 units of affordable housing per year for the next 10 years to meet the current demand. Um, so there's that many families that are, are cost burdened or, you know, inappropriately housed or unsafely housed that we need to create affordable housing for that number just sounds ridiculous, you know, to, to imagine how we're going to get close to, to doing that. Uh, what thoughts do you have on, on the housing part of this issue and, and what we might do as a community, as a society to, to begin addressing that? When we talk about the housing crisis and the shortages, we often talk about building, but we also, we need to talk about preservation too. You know, it's, it's often the case that it's cheaper to preserve the low income housing that we have instead of letting that housing fall off the market, you know, by getting too, too run down. And so I think one of the approaches has to be like a housing survey and intervening in housing that we're at risk of losing in the next five or 10 years as we think about building. When we think about building, we also have to think about the laws that govern building. Yeah. And, you know, underneath um, our cities are these giant zoning laws and these walls we build our, around our communities. And so if somehow like, you know, Lancaster just got a billion dollars or five billion dollars to build whatever, you know, tomorrow, where are you going to build it? You know, because, right. in most, you know, most residential land, it's illegal to build any kind of multifamily or affordable family. That's going to change. Yeah. I think that, you know, this is a case where the moral leaders, the faith leaders in the community really have a role to play to stay stand up and be like, look, if we're going to really get serious about the problem, it really does mean every community pitching in and doing its fair share. Mm -hmm. The thing that slows down building is us, 
often. Mm -hmm. Unless we get real zoning reform, we're not going to be able to build our our way out of this at scale in in a way that's timely and meets the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I think the other piece, as you speak about the moral aspect of it, when we think about what's our role to play in it, it is, you know, who's going to stand up and speak up so that we can make those kind of changes because zoning and and those kind of exclusionary municipal um, legislation is it's not going to change if people don't get loud because people will show up to oppose a new development. Right. They're every loud. Every single time. Right. Uh, they're loud. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it may be the minority who are speaking up, but if they're loud enough, it sounds like a majority. And so right. we, we all need to be willing to do that. I think the other piece of it is there are many of us who can play a role in the smaller scale. Um, and one of our local municipalities actually has passed a auxiliary unit um, zoning, which allows people to take that, you know, in-laws quarters or that, um, you know, or put a tiny home in their backyard and create, you know, affordable housing on a micro scale all across our communities. And that's something that a lot of people have the capacity to do as, yeah. as you know, I, I live in a small city row home, but I'm an empty nester now. And so can I make one of the rooms in our house available to somebody? Mm-hmm. If I did live out in the in the suburbs and had a large enough house, could I convert, you know, that downstairs bedroom into an apartment and rent it? Right now, I wouldn't be allowed to. But if I saw it both from a market opportunity and from a moral uh, standpoint to, to say, man, I want to help my neighbor who's struggling right now and I can turn this into a small apartment if my municipality would allow me to, and it could benefit multiple people. Um, But when we think about homelessness, um, what gives you hope right now uh, as you look at the potential future? um, And and maybe what what would you encourage us at Water Street to consider um, recognizing our role? We're we're one piece of the puzzle, Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Matt. I think that, you know, we're at this, this is a little cliche, but we're at, we are really at an inflection point when it comes to housing and homeless crisis. You know, we, it, it is an agenda that is now top of the national agenda. Mm. And when I started working on these issues with eviction, it was not on the top of the national agenda. Yeah. And, you know, the debate, right, that we just had the presidential debate, you know, first answer out of the gate is about the housing crisis. Mm. And I think that, you know, that's, that's very, you know, that gives me hope that a lot of politicians on both sides of the aisle are getting very serious about this issue. Is that going to turn into tangible action is, is really the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we saw a lot to be for in the pandemic. You know, we saw evictions drop to the lowest they've ever been on record. We saw this incredible um, development of eviction diversion programs, right? Like low cost, really effective interventions uh, that provided legal assistance, some rental support, and often mandated landlords participate in mediation. That was incredibly effective at, yeah. at preventing eviction. I think that's very, that's very hopeful as well. And what the country has done with veteran homelessness over the last, you know, two decades, this has been a huge success story. Mm-hmm. And it's been a success story. You know, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel here. We just finally got political will to to fund to fund the intervention at, at scale. Yeah. And so I think that that's a very hopeful, hopeful thing, too. You know, we could we could go one of two ways right now. You know, I mean, the, the tolerance for the homeless crisis in many cities has now reached kind of a fever pitch. Yeah. And it can either result in a political will that manifests in stable, affordable housing, more services, something that actually attack, attacks the root cause of the problem or it could result in punitive policies and, you know, clearing encampments and moving homeless folks out of our cities to God knows where. And so that's a less hopeful note to end on, but that's, yeah. the, that's how I feel right now about where we could go. One of the things at Water Street that we've, we've recognized over time is that um, often material poverty um, is accompanied by, um, or maybe even um, preceded by, relational poverty, um, that uh, not that poor people lack in relationships, but often those who lack in relationships have less um, ability to endure those those falls, right? So somebody who's evicted, who has no, they've alienated the relationships with family and friends, has nowhere to turn, and they end up on the street. 
I'm curious your thoughts on that intersection of, of relational poverty uh, and material poverty or, or as a contributing factor when somebody is struggling, um, where relationships can, can buoy them or the lack of relationships can be a contributing factor. And, and maybe this is too big of a question, but how then does that affect our solutions to, to homelessness and poverty as we try to walk with people in that? Well, I think a clear way it can affect our solutions is to make sure we're not imposing unnecessary rules on our policy that do get in the way of people's relationships. For example, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of times where folks have a Section 8 voucher and, you know, they would love to uh, house, a, house a cousin on hard times or let their sister move in, but they can't. They're, they're at risk of losing their voucher yeah. if they do so. You know, there are folks that are in public housing that they would love to welcome home, you know, a formerly incarcerated, you know, uh, person when they get out mm -hmm. and they can't, you know. And so I think that in our policy, we have baked in things that break relationships when it comes to allowing each other's material needs. I think that's one thing we can really think about. You know, if if you or I, you know, lost out everything tomorrow, it would take a while to get to the bottom because we're in a network of, of middle class friends. Though, yeah. right? And so when we're thinking about poverty, we also should think about network poverty, where, you know, poverty requires often people to put incredible strain on each other. The problem is often, you know, when we're when we're really hurting, we're asking our neighbors and our friends and our relatives to carry a giant weight. Yeah. And, you know, and and a, and a lot of times that that can be really fracturing. Those so, relational networks are already strained. Yeah, they're already strained. Yeah. And so I think that one implication is if we do a better job of meeting people's material needs, mm -hmm. I think that would allow the relationships to flourish in a way that they're they struggle to now. Yeah. This has been a, a fantastic conversation. I feel like I've, I've gained a lot from it. Um, I hope those of you who are listening or watching our Restores podcast have, have enjoyed this and, and hopefully learned a little bit from our conversation today. Uh, Matthew Desmond, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day.